So welcome everybody and uh, we are sorry for this few minutes of delay, a little yes. bit of logistics issue, but luckily all has been sorted out now. So uh, Pallavi, uh, welcome to ISAS and uh, I think uh, uh, we would be uh, happy to have you back here again when you pass, whether in transit or <coughs> whenever, because uh, uh, you've been uh, based in a part of the world which has been an important area for, for us. Uh, we do focus a lot on the South Asia, Southeast Asia interactions, and we are happy to hear your insights from you. I'm not going to get into a very detailed introduction of yours, because uh, I think as, as you yourself mentioned, the fact that uh, uh, you're a journalist, have worked in different parts of Asia, including China, uh, then later in Europe, and now finally in Indonesia. Uh, many of us are familiar with your writings. And you're, a, you're an author as well at the same time, I guess. So maybe I'll leave you to say a little bit more about yourself if you think it's necessary. <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, please get on to your own subject. Thank yes. you. And maybe 30 minutes and then we can have a discussion. So I was born in 1975 and then I went to school and then I went to university. So no, sorry, I'm not going to actually tell you that much more about myself. I think that's more than enough. Thank you very much for having me here. I'm very pleased to be here, to meet lots of new friends and some old faces. We have seen Ajahn Mohan over here who's been a great inspiration to me and really the, the, the first person, the, my, the first book I wrote came out of uh, the kernel of an idea that he gave me when we met at a party. So I've always owed him a great debt and thank you for being here and I hope it's not dull for you because you've heard me talking several times before as well. Um, as was made clear um, uh, during that brief introduction, um, I've had really quite a disparate uh, career and a disparate set of experiences over the last 13 years, having lived first in um, China for a period of around seven years and then moving to Brussels, Belgium, where I covered Europe for an Indian newspaper for uh, three and a half, four years. And then more recently, around a year and a half ago, moved to Jakarta in Indonesia, where I now, now write for um, the Hindu, uh, an Indian newspaper covering Southeast Asia with a focus on Indonesia. Um, but while I think that this has been a sort of di disparate set of experiences and circumstances, uh, what I've learned from it is really the importance of making connections and also of looking at many of these parts of the world in a comparative framework. Because I do think that that comparative framework brings out uh, fresh insights uh, that can be very interesting. Um, I thought I'd begin a little bit by talking about uh, when I first moved to China. This was back in 2002, um, at a time when India and China were coming out of quite a long um, uh, a phase where there was a diplomatic freeze um, and um, trade was very at the very low level uh, at around between three and four billion dollars and there was very little people to people contact um, exemplified by the fact that there was no direct flight between the two countries at the time. In fact the only way to get from um, from Beijing to Delhi uh, directly was on an uh, Ethiopian Airlines flight uh, because it used to go to Addis Ababa and stop over in Delhi. But things changed quite rapidly right after the point that I arrived in 2002 and we had a sudden sort of surge in uh, the relationship and an uptake um, with the, ch you know, the, the flights, for example, suddenly burgeoned to three or four direct flights a week. Um, trade started to double, triple quite quickly. Um, you know, there was a greater texture to the relationship relationship as well. You could, uh, for example, see many more Indian restaurants in Chinese cities. Uh, and the term, that awful term, Chindia, was also coined. Uh, I think it was uh, a sort of portmanteau that was that I first came across uh, by a Indian politician Jairam Ramesh uh, in, a, in a book that he wrote. Um, and Chindia, for a while, came to kind of signify this idea of the coming together of India and China in the new Asian century, as it were. A formidable coming together of the factory of the world and the back office of the world into this kind of hardware, software collaboration that was going to be transformative. Um, but, you know, um, even while all of this was happening and in the high noon of Chindia as it was, um, if you looked at the journalists on the ground, it told a very different picture. Um, politicians are very 
fond of talking about how the populations of India and China together combined account for uh, a third of the world population. We're looking at uh, you know 2.5 billion people. Um, but covering this kind of relationship between 2.5 Indian people from the Indian side in China, uh, when I moved, was a lone Indian journalist, one guy who worked for uh, an Indian um, government um, uh, news agency, and he didn't speak Chinese, and he spent most of his time sitting in his apartment, basically rewriting Xinhua pieces and uh, sending them on to Delhi. Um, so this was the kind of quality of the information that was available to Indians. Um, and, uh, you know, gradually, um, as the, the, the sort of, I, like I was talking about the high noon of, of, of Chindia, India really developed somewhat of a China obsession, a China pathology. Um, and there was a lot of demand for news from China, and there was certainly a lot of opinion about China. And we had uh, a lot of reactions um, um, ranging somewhere between pride and prejudice, um, uh, you know, that were constantly dominating the front pages of the newspapers. Um, but, you know, we didn't, who was generating this knowledge? Um, I think it's very important. Um, why does it matter who's generating this knowledge? Um, because the way in which we understand the world, the way in which we make sense of the world, depends on who is producing this knowledge, uh, within what kind of conceptual framework or with what mentality that knowledge is being produced. And, you know, as I have spent time in Asia, it's become increasingly apparent to me that uh, while Asian countries are kind of allowed to talk about themselves within their own borders, so for example, um, Indian newspapers, you know, produce a huge amount of information about India. Chinese newspapers produce a huge amount of information about China. Indonesian newspapers produce a huge amount of information about Indonesia within their own borders. But the power to talk across borders was, dare I say, colonized by the West. And so you had this entire profession of the foreign correspondent, which um, in practice had meant the Western foreign correspondent. Um, so in, in China, um, I became the only uh, Chinese-speaking Indian foreign correspondent. When I moved to Brussels, which is the headquarters of the European Union, um, and again, another big hub for international journalism, I was the only Indian foreign correspondent. And then when I moved to Jakarta in Southeast Asia, which is again a very important theater in the 21st century, I am the only Indian foreign correspondent. So I've kind of got used to this, this lonely ride, as it were. Um, now, a journalist, like um, any other observer, has a kind of lens through which she understands and interprets issues. And journalists don't like to be reminded about this lens, lens sometimes because it kind of brings to the fore the subjectivity of all writing. And as journalists, we are trained to be objective in, uh, in what we are reporting. But I, this, this lens that I'm referring to is, of course, something that's internal. It cannot be taken off like a pair of glasses, although you can be more or less self-reflexive about it. But even the most sensitive observer has innate ideas about norms and standards against which they often, unselfconsciously perhaps, assess what they are seeing. I'll give you a few examples from my time in China, if I may. Um, how is the way in which I, as an Indian, um, different um, uh, in terms of assessing what I was seeing compared to, say, a Western foreign correspondent? Um, the first example is quite banal but telling. And it's something as everyday as attitudes to traffic in the city of Beijing. Uh, most of my friends were, were Europeans or, or Americans, and you know we would sit down every evening over a drink. And the standard sort of expat gripe about life in China was oh, the awful traffic. These people don't know how to drive. They're so pig-headed in traffic jams. They honk constantly. They can't follow rules, and so on. And then I would go and I would pick up an Indian friend from the airport, and as they would be driving into the city, virtually the first thing they would say was, oh, the Chinese are so orderly. They drive in such a amazingly, you know, rule-bound manner. They're like robots. Where's the honking? Where's the cars? So it was a diametrically opposite take on the same phenomenon. Um, take another example. Um, we would go to the Hutongs, the sort of old part of uh, Imperial Beijing, where you have these crisscrossing alleyways, and we would see a public toilet over there. And most Westerners would immediately remark about the kind of dehumanizing aspect of these public toilets, that they were stinky, that there were often no partitions. 
um, but this was an awful sort of hellhole. And again, I would take an Indian friend and they would comment on something like, oh, look at the toilet cleaners, they're wearing gloves. And the fact that this single simple protective article was putting a barrier between bacteria and their skin and preventing all kinds of infections and this was a great thing because so many people in so many manual scavengers in India don't have that kind of gear. Um, a third and last example, um, let's look at, um, you know, in the run-up to the Olympic Games, um, there was a big corruption scandal and the vice mayor of Beijing was arrested uh, uh, for some uh, massive corrupt act. Both my Western colleagues and I were shocked, but we were shocked for very different reasons. They were shocked because of the corruption. I was shocked because of the arrest. I mean, to me, <laughs> impunity was the norm in many ways. Um, so, you know, I've been talking about this idea of an Asian lens and the importance of how Asians read other Asians as something that's been missing. Um, and not only read other Asians, but other parts of the world. So I've just had a new book out. Um, it's called Punjabi Parmesan. And um, the title comes from Indian immigrants um, to Italy, uh, Punjabi immigrants uh, that basically work in the dairy um, industry over there. And uh, they are now represent the second largest um, Indian diaspora in Europe outside the UK. And this is quite a hidden diaspora because it's in the countryside, not many people talk about it. But they do say that if the Sikh uh, 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 dairy farmers went on strike in Italy for a single day, then the, the production of Parmesan cheese would kind of come to a a ground, a ground in halt. Um, and immigration is one of the themes that I deal with in this new book. Um, but what this book is, um, you know, Amitabh Ghosh um, has written a very um, uh, kind uh, sort of endorsement about it. And he calls it a sort of Asian lens on Europe. So once again, I'm trying to talk about this Asian perspective. And in this book, what I try to do is bring, to br bring out not just an Indian perspective, but an Indian Chinese perspective, the perspective of an Indian who's just moved to Europe from China. What does this place look like? Um, uh, the subtitle is Dispatches from a Europe in Crisis, and I'm, to I'm trying to talk about what, uh, what, is, what does this kind of first world crisis look like to an Asian. Um, you know, it's a kind of nice smelling, well dressed, bucolic crisis. There are no tanks in the street, there are no sort of starving children. Uh, but this is a crisis, and, and what kind of crisis is it? What's the texture of this crisis? Um, if you permit me, I thought, um, uh, again, just to sort of bring out this comparative framework that I'm talking about, I'd do a quick reading from the book before continuing. Um, oh, I don't have. So I'm talking about uh, having just moved uh, along with my family from Beijing to Brussels. We began our European lives, just as continental Europe was gearing up for what the Belgians, or at least the French speaking amongst them, called Les Grands Vacances. This was a staggeringly long period between July and August when large parts of the continent and certainly Brussels came to a halt with everyone from EU civil servants to primary school teachers heading off on a grand vacation, clasping suntan lotion and beach towels. It was not a good time to be attempting to settle in. in. Every time I tried to get hold of a gardener, plumber, or chauffeur to lure them to a newly rented home with offers of large sums of money, my efforts were met with a hollow laugh. Me, calling a gardener recommended by a friend. Hello, any chance you could come over tomorrow to take a look at our garden? It needs mowing and weeding and the hedge needs urgent pruning. The gardener, cackling in amusement. Tomorrow? No, madame, it is impossible. Me making a second, less ambitious attempt. Okay, how about next week? The gardener with a sniffy mix of pity and contempt. But madame, I am fully booked for the next month. If you still wish it, I can try and make it after the vacances. I think I have a vacancy on September 24th. We were speaking in May. And, and so it went. It took us four months to buy a car because the sales staff we made initial contact with at various car dealerships invariably vanished on vacation when we tried to call them a second time. This was more problematic than one might imagine as it became tougher and tougher to get around the city with public buses having halved their frequency following a special brand vacance schedule as we approached July. 
My first reactions to, to Europe, to Brussels, were really conditioned by seven years in China, a throbbing driven world on the go 24 seven. Beijing is a city where 1,000 bed hospitals had been set up in seven days. Factories along the country's long coast buzzed night and day, producing the cameras, clothes, sex toys, cheese graters, car jacks, and electrical equipment that stocked the world's shops. Cargo ships leaving from the ports of Hong Kong and Shenzhen alone carried upwards of 40 million standard 20-foot long containers annually, or one per second around the clock year round. Imagine then my disorientation in having landed from China in Brussels, a city that not only shut shop for Le Grand Vacances, but every Sunday as well. When I tried to impress people by telling them how China was pretty much open for business 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they would shake their heads sadly, exclaiming, yes, isn't it terrible? Not quite the reaction I was hoping for. In China, as in India, money definitely made the world go round. Even the Chinese Communist Party had turned blatantly capitalist. The opportunity to find work, make more money, and improve one's lot in life is what drove everyone from migrant workers in assembly lines to university students sitting exams and business executives putting in extra hours. But China's arguably excessive focus on the material is understandable given its 20th century past. The ability to make money had been a hard-earned right, one that couldn't be taken for granted. What I found more difficult to understand was the strange disconnect between the offer of money and the provision of services I so regularly encountered in Brussels. Plumbers were simply not interested in interrupting their weekends in order to come and help you out with a leaking faucet, even at 50 or 100 euro a pop. It just didn't seem to be worth it to them. Many Europeans I talked to about what to me was a peculiar lack of interest in making more money when the opportunity presented itself confirmed my observation with pride. Yes, they would say smugly, Money is not everything to us. Time spent with family, eating a hearty lunch, indulging in hobbies like gardening, and of course, enjoying vacations, these were the important things in life, I was instructed, not just making money. Of course, homes with gardens, lip-smacking meals, and relaxing vacations did not materialize for free, but I understood their meaning. Their conceit revolved around the idea that unlike in China, making money was not an end in itself in continental Western, for this patently did not apply to the Romanians, Bulgarians, et al., Europe. But what they, did, what they did not acknowledge was how this hierarchy of values is not the result of innately refined European culture, but in fact underpinned by enormous benefits that were increasingly unsustainable. But this was back in 2009, several months before years of dodgy bookkeeping in Greece came to light, sparking the fiscal fires that would blaze across the Eurozone for the next few years, forcing governments to break the news to their uncomprehending publics that these privileges could no longer be protected. It was no longer business as usual. So um, that was the kind of European period in my life, that's, a part, that's, a, that's a, a part from the very beginning, and uh, I ended up being there for three and a half years, and refined uh, my analysis of the situation considerably. These were kind of, um, um, uh, you know, knee-jerk reactions in some way, as someone who's just moved from this kind of Asia on the rise to a European in, in, decl in, in decline. Um, and then more recently, I moved to Indonesia, uh, once again, as the only foreign correspondent from India. I have to say, in some ways, moving to Indonesia has been the greatest uh, surprise or the greatest shock to me. Um, China, as I had mentioned earlier, was somewhere that Indians have come to become almost pathologically obsessed with. So there's a lot of information out there about China, whether it's accurate or not. Moving to Europe, to some extent, there was a sense of deja vu because, you know, I mean, so much of our, at least um, uh, given my kind of background, my education has been dominated from a Eurocentric Western, you know, standpoint. Uh, and so, you know, when you visit a lot of these cities, it's like you've already seen them before, even if you haven't been there. It's, it's a very comfortable world to be slipping into, and quite familiar in its texture and fabric. Uh, but what was really shocking about moving to Indonesia was how little I knew about it, in fact, like absolutely nothing, despite the fact 
that it was so obviously and so immediately, deeply connected to India. The historical ties were so strong. Life in Jakarta was so resonant of India, and yet we had been so sort of cut off from each other. I mean, the island of Java's classical Hindu history has meant that living in Jakarta often felt like having wandered onto the set of a, of a Mahabharata or Ramayan TV serial. We were talking earlier today, you know, people pepper ordinary conversation with words like manushya and karana, which, you know, is uh, karana means uh, because in Sanskrit and manushya means man. But these are very archaic terms <laughs> that we are familiar with in India, uh, but, you know, are kind of used in everyday language in Indonesia. Um, I tried to take a taxi um, to the National Museum when I first arrived, and the taxi driver didn't understand what I was saying, and I was describing it to him. And then finally he turned around and was like, oh, you mean the museum, Gajaha. Gajaha is a classical uh, phrase for elephant, right? And uh, I learned it when I was like, you know, 10 years old in school, and there's this big elephant outside the museum. And it's, so it's just a, you know, it's a very strange sort of classically classical connection with this country. Um, my very first, uh, the first banker I met was called Vishnu. My, for my real estate agent was called Devi. Uh, uh, so, and you know, and I was in this completely alien territory that I had had no connection with until I arrived, uh, arrived there really. Um, and I think uh, wandering around China, wandering around Indonesia, uh, it's really driven home how deeply connected Asia has been. Um, um, through traders, through pilgrims, through warriors, with conquest, religion, trade, binding us together. And there's been this sort of constant shock of recognition over the last several years. Um, uh, I remember f first feeling that when I wandered into the Shaolin Temple in, uh, in China, which is such a sort of celebrated site. And as I was wandering into the temple, I saw this big statue of a monk, and he looked like Indian. And I kept staring at him and saying, you know, what is an Indian monk doing over here? Until I discovered, yes, that it's Dhamma, Bodhi Dharma, right? Who is supposed to be the founder of, uh, of, of, of Chinese Buddhism, of Zen, uh, Zen Buddhism in China. Um, and an Indian monk is credited uh, with having uh, the, uh, the, the, the credit for having built the, the temple in 496 is another Indian monk called Bada or Batua. Um, you know, shocks of recognition all over in Indonesia. The fact that the airline is called uh, Garuda, that the national clothes, you know, they go on about the national clothes and then they produce batik, which is like pretty standard, you know, Indian designs. And when you look at the textile trade that, that, that existed between India and China and the fact that Gujarati textiles have been going to Indonesia since the 5th, 6th, 7th century and were extremely prized textiles. So we have this long tradition of interminglings of writings, um, uh, not only like the famous Tahim and Xuanzang, but you know, Zheng He, of course. And then in Indonesia, you really have this kind of coming together of both the Chinese and the Indian influence, which is very fascinating. Um, um, you know, you had all these um, monks. There was a Chinese monk called Ijing who spent years in Indonesia before traveling to India. So you have this whole Buddhist arc that's connecting these places. And what I found even more interesting um, than Buddhism, which for long has been known as a sort of facilitator of a pan-Asian culture, civilization, uh, cultural connections, was Islam as a kind of connector. And the fact that Islam, the conversion of Indonesia to Islam um, in the 16th and 17th centuries was largely done by Indian Muslims and Chinese Muslims. I mean, I knew about the Indian Muslims from Gujarat, but uh, Jankha, the admiral, who himself was, uh, was, was Muslim, uh, had come and left behind a whole number of uh, 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 Muslim um, ch Chinese traders and so on, who played a role. And they, in, in according to Indonesian history, there's nine people called the Wali Songo, who are the kind of nine luminaries who are held responsible for the conversion. And out of these nine, four were Chinese Muslim. Uh, so it's really quite uh, fascinating. And then what happens, you know, I mean, you have colonialism disrupting this. You have um, trade routes that existed between Asians that were wrested away, the creation of new borders, new rivalries. And as a whole region, you have this economically demoralized region that kind of turns inward instead of outwards. And so you now have a, uh, a situation where somebody like me who was growing up in India really felt alienated and completely unconnected to a culture like China and certainly Indonesia. Um, 
Um, things have been changing, and um, uh, we can go into that. I think we have a very interesting new kinds of diasporas in um, um, Indian diasporas in China, in particular. Um, uh, you know, going beyond the kind of multinational executive uh, and embracing people like thousands upon thousands of Indian medical students, hundreds of yoga teachers, um, hotel doormen. I mean, there's a whole new kind of blue collar migration that's happened as well not just a kind of executive uh, white collar migration. Um, and then uh, we, of course, have uh, s very interesting diaspora communities in Indonesia as well. Um, a large number from Tamil Nadu, uh, particularly in Sumatra, uh, who've been there since the 19th century. And then the Sindhis, um, uh, who, who dominate some very interesting um, areas of the Indonesian economy, in particular the entertainment industry, where they really run the movie business and the, the Sinitron business, which is that sort of television soap opera. So it's all run by Sindhis, uh, called Punjabi. Uh, uh, but I thought um, what I'd do is just hi you know, highlight some of the, the strong contemporary and historical parallels that I'm seeing between India and Indonesia. These are very germane parallels, and I think that the two have so much to learn from each other. And in a way, India-Indonesia comparisons um, you know, um, yield mo are more productive than India-China comparisons. Uh, India-China comparisons are far more common. Um, uh, but sometimes it's a bit like comparing apples to oranges. You can compare them, but so what? Whereas I think with Indonesia, there are real learnings um, uh, and real things that the two countries could be watching about each other, uh, and especially as we're sort of both going to be entering elections this year. Uh, so both countries are heading into elections with leaders who are nearing the end of their tenure as lame ducks their credibility wounded by corruption scandals, and their capacity to act hamstrung by coalition politics. The problems that they have failed to address are largely the same. Deep-seated deep corruption, infrastructural lacuna, um, economic reforms, a lack of governmental capacity, and growing, I mean, religious intolerance. Um, both countries have uh, crested a kind of wave of economic growth and foreign investment over the last decade. They both have a youthful demographic profile. Um, you know, so demographic dividend is made much of in both countries. An expanding middle class consumer base has led many an excitable investment banker to mark them as the economies to watch. Um, but over the last year or so, um, the, these kind of cantering economies have slowed down, cu massive current account deficits and plunging currencies are amongst the kind of unappetizing items um, that um, the leaders currently have to contend with. Um, the deeper parallels, uh, of course, the cu cultural, historical, linguistic affinities, but the fact that both nations are these tapestries of multiple languages, geographies, and religions welded together by the imagining of a state which valorizes unity in diversity. Their tolerant traditions and syncretic heritage are, however, not always easy to protect, given the rise of fundamentalism uh, amongst certain domestic constituencies. Um, again, you know, I was in India recently, and we were talking about various Asian-related issues, and people kept getting up in the audience and talking about how unique India is, and this is something that I hear a lot about Indian exceptionalism, right? Uh, we are uniquely diverse. We are uniquely, uh, you know, look at the languages, look at how large we are, look at our problems, nobody else has them. And I always keep saying, yeah, like, you know, Indonesia, that's <laughs> pretty big, lots of languages, 17,000 of them, lots of religions, great diversity. It just doesn't occur to Indians. And, and you know, despite the fact that Indonesia is actually a neighbor, we don't count it as a neighbor. It's a maritime neighbor. But when we talk about neighbors, we will count Afghanistan, sure, which is not, uh, technically, uh, but not, not Indonesia. It's really somewhere that we don't look at. Um, so since Indonesia's transition to democracy in 1998, these commonalities have only increased. Um, India is the world's largest democracy. Indonesia is third largest one. Um, the two countries are also home to the largest, um, uh, in the case of Indonesia, and third largest in the case of India, numbers of Muslims in the world. So, you know, lots and lots of interesting parallels over there. Um, I think that we're seeing quite a lot of interesting parallels in the upcoming elections as well. Um, if you look at the contenders, 
um, you've kind of got the, the the sort of patriarchs of politics that uh, trace their lineage back to the Sepia tainted days of the independence movement, right? So you've got Megawati Sukarno Putri sort of holding aloft the banner of Sukarno, and then you have the Gandhis. And uh, I just did a, a piece recently on you know the Congress Party and the PDIP. Uh, Megawati's party is the PDIP, and how uh, I think the Congress should be looking very closely at what's happening at the PDIP going forward. And why? Because I think in Indian politics, the really the central question uh, of the medium term of Indian politics is going to be, is the Congress party going to be able to outgrow the Gandhis or not? It's essentially a question of irrelevance, or will they be able to somehow uh, overcome the fact that they have been uh, a family party? And the PBIP is going through exactly the same thing. It's essentially a Sukarno party, but in the hands of Megawati, it essentially will either face irrelevance, because nobody is going to vote for her, we've, it's, uh, we've already made that very clear, or she will have to give her permission for the party to kind of go away from her. And it's not at all clear about uh, what she's going to do. Um, Indonesia has uh, Jokowi, yeah, Joko Widodo, who's the governor of Jakarta, and it's very, very clear uh, from all the opinion polls that he's a clear front runner in the elections. He's the guy, uh, he's the outsider, he's Indonesia's Obama, he's the clean, anti corrupt, efficient person that everybody wants, but he belongs to the PDIP. And despite the fact that if he stands as president, the PDIP will win, will win, Megawati has still not been able to bring herself to declare him as the candidate. Uh, she is essentially holding off until the parliamentary elections, which are next month, and there's a lot of rumors about why. So if PBIP does well in the parliamentary elections, the idea is that she will stand again. But if PBIP does badly in the parliamentary elections, then she knows she has no hope, and she will let Jokowi stand, possibly with her son uh, on the vice presidential ticket, so keeping the Sukarno you know, name in there somewhere. Um, but it's really not clear, and you know, it continues to be a very dynastic party, and everybody's reading the tea leaves, or, in, or, or Megawati's body language, as the case might be, and whether she smiles when she's near Jokowi, or whether she stands near him or not. And, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's quite a ridiculous situation. And we also have other archetypes uh, in common. You know, I mean, uh, we have Modi in play in India, um, and the second most popular contender in uh, Indonesia is Prabowo of Garindra. And I mean, there, there, there are some ways in which they are very different, but they both promise kind of efficient government, and they appeal to a kind of yearning for authoritarianism and, you know, strong government and the fact that you need some, these, these are chaotic, crazy places, you know, and, and they need a kind of firm hand and so on. And they both have slightly problematic pasts and different kinds, again, that, you know, have human rights abuses leveled against them and so on. Um, so, you know, we have very interesting times um, ahead of us politically and um, uh, uh, in both countries with these elections coming up. So I really do think that the comparisons are very germane. Um, and so many other areas, I mean, corruption, for example, the Indonesia's uh, anti-corruption agency um, uh, is something that uh, it has a lot of relevance for India again. Um, it's, it's, you know, it was, it's been founded in a very corrupt country. Indonesia is on par with India uh, when it comes to corruption. But it has really been able to end the impunity to a certain extent. If you get caught, you get in trouble. If you get caught, I mean, so you can still not get caught. But in India, you can get caught and nothing happens, you know, I mean, still, which is what used to be the case with uh, Indonesia uh, 10 years ago. And we have this great ferment going on in India for the last several years about corruption, setting up an anti-corruption agency, Jan Lokpal, and so on. PPK is a very interesting model, I think, for India to study about how they've done it, um, with very few resources, again, at their disposal and a lot of political opposition. Um, decentralization is another obvious area where there's very interesting comparisons uh, uh, because Indonesia has decentralized quite dramatically with uh, beneficial effects and also adverse effects. And, you know, there's decentralization something that in India has always been urged that this is what we need to do. But I think, again, studying the impact of it um, on Indonesia would be something that would be really quite um, uh, useful. So I've spoken over half an hour over here, and I'd love to kind of make this into more of a discussion and talk a little bit. Um, uh, but you know, I have to say that uh, for a long time, uh, I was very skeptical of this idea of Asia 
And whenever I go uh, abroad and, you know, people, uh, people would talk about Asia, I used to think it was a kind of orientalist construct, you know. We are not, there's no Asia. India has nothing to do with China. We have nothing to do with Indonesia. What are all these places? Why are you lumping us together? You know, this is, and it's really taken me in this, these last 12 or 13 years to realize that, you know, there is something to the idea of Asia. There's something that is underlying over there that's been broken and we've kind of lost that uh, feeling so it doesn't capture our imagination and it almost feels like false consciousness when we talk about it, but it exists. Um, and um, yeah, so I'll leave it at that and I'd be very happy to talk about China, India, Indonesia, Brussels, anything.